Well, hello and good evening and welcome to episode 17 of Fracking Nightmare. Wow, it seems uh, that I was only here a few minutes ago with uh, Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report. And that was um, episode uh, four, where we were looking at weather wars. So uh, if you want to uh, look at another subject that's not totally unrelated in many ways, although the, uh, the link may not be immediately obvious, but it will come together in future weeks. So tonight, we continue with looking at what's going on in the world of fracking, or primarily anti-fracking. And uh, at week 17, it's uh, I think it was the end of October when we did the first edition of Fracking Nightmare, and I'm pleased to report that the UK remains frack free. And uh, I hope that's the same when we get to episode 77, and God forbid, episode 777. You know, we are going to do everything we possibly can to ensure that the UK government ultimately comprehends that the British people do not grant social license to the abomination known as hydraulic fracturing. Well, tonight, we were going to have a report from Zurofwolf in Poland, where the uh, Polish campaign um, against uh, fracking there over near the Ukrainian border. Uh, of course, Ukraine in the uh, news for uh, another reason other than fracking right now. But over near the border, the community of Zurofwolf have been protesting or protecting the community against Chevron for some 300 days and today was going to be the day that the protection community was going to be evicted but thanks to national coverage international coverage and not least of course massive campaigns through the social and alternative media it would seem that the eviction has been postponed. Well, all I can do is encourage people watching this who are within easy travelling distance, which means a day away at least, within easy travelling distance of Zurofwolf, get over to Zurofwolf with your phone cameras, with your cameras, and record the action. What we also want to see is whether the troops, because that's what it will be, the troops who are effectively brought in to force the eviction are actually Polish. Because what we are anticipating right throughout the European Union is an increasing usage of foreign police and foreign special forces like the TAU, Thugs Are Us in Manchester, to bring uh, to come along and uh, force these evictions. In other words, people that have absolutely no empathy with the communities that they're evicting. Well, the TAU don't have any empathy anyway, but that's another story. This is the way it should be, by the way, Greater Manchester Police. This is the way it should be. For 300 days, the Polish police have simply observed, making the observation that the issue is between the community and central government. And the police are purely there to ensure that the peace is maintained. Now, that's of course the way it should be in the UK. But the police officers, when they come along to Barton Moss, are not there on their oath. They are there as corporate enforcers. And what we are seeing in the UK is a fairly rapid slide towards a corporatist police state where despite the fact that there is no social license, no mandate from the people to pursue this pernicious industry, the government and the unconventional gas industry believe it is their right to use the police as their corporate enforcers. Now what we've seen is the, the police in the Greater Manchester area be humiliated, embarrassed, nose put out of joint, along with Salford City Council, along with IGAS, and indeed the UK government. And this started when Barton Moss Road was ruled to be a footpath. And therefore the 100 plus arrests of people uh, who had been taken into custody for allegedly obstructing the highway are likely to see their charges annulled 
because it's difficult to be charged with obstructing the highway when it's not actually a highway. It's a footpath. So after that unique ruling and that catalytic ruling, somehow the British media all seem to collude to bring about a national blackout on anything associated with Barton Moss. Now, you know, this is to be expected. What we're looking at here is a highly politicised agenda. David Cameron and uh, George Osborne and, uh, of course, uh, Lord John Brown have dug a massive hole for themselves and they are determined to stay in that hole come hell or high water, despite oh, high water, yes, possibly sooner rather than later. But uh, they intend to see this agenda pushed through, despite the fact that this was not part of any manifesto in the run-up to the last election. And David Cameron, of course, stated that if he got into office, his government would be the greenest government ever. Well, now, of course, George Osborne is trying to claim that uh, actually fracking is green. Yes, George. Well, you know, it's the classic case of tell a lie often enough, then you, know, you might actually believe it yourself and you might get a few gullible people to believe it also. The reality is that the Barton Moss campaign may not have been going on for 300 days, but if it was 300 days, then the resolve would be just as strong as the people of Zurawow in eastern Poland. Now, after the ruling, there was two days of inactivity as the protection community refused to allow the trucks up Barton Moss Road, which of course was going to get a reaction. And the reaction came on the Saturday when we saw Greater Manchester Police exercise greater brutality than we had previously seen. The TAU on the front line marching the trucks up at an outrageous pace and pulling people off the road, but not for obstructing the highway. Oh no, now it was aggravated trespass. Well, the following Tuesday, in fact, it was last Tuesday, because last Monday I left the studio here in Plymouth and hightailed it up the M5 and M6 to arrive at uh, Barton Moss on the Tuesday morning. And after the trucks had been walked in that morning, the bailiffs appeared, anonymous bailiffs, because they refused to identify themselves, and they handed out the eviction notices, stating that the hearing would take place in the uh, um, courts, the civil courts in Manchester on Friday, literally giving 72 hours to mount a defence. Well, Thanks to the inspired insight of uh, a couple of people in the Manchester area, uh, not least uh, Helen Chunso, who has been on this programme before, uh, a firm of lawyers were contacted in London by the name of Lee Day, who specialise in environmental cases such as this. And uh, um, Lee Day appointed a, a barrister by the name of Lindsay Johnson, and he performed sterling work in the courts on Friday and much to the chagrin of Peel's barrister, a lady by the name of Catherine Holland. Um, I think she probably talked herself out of a victory but uh, nonetheless the judge ruled that the case should be adjourned for two weeks. Now <clears throat> up until now Peel Holdings, who own Barton Moss Road, and uh, well, along with another Peel company, the Manchester Ship Canal Company, have basically stayed literally on the sidelines, preferring to leave it to IGAS, the Greater Manchester Police, and uh, Salford City Council. But now Peel have been forced to come into the arena on the basis that Peel own the road and the land adjoining the road, and they are now seeking to evict the camp. So when anything like this happens, of course, it brings a little bit of attention to the company that are trying to um, force that eviction. And this is a very interesting report. It's Peel and the Liverpool city region. Now, this report is uh, literally about uh, just under a couple of years old. And the report is entitled Predatory Capitalism or Providential Corporatism. So once again, we are looking at the corporatist 
state, or in this case, the corporatist region. And in next week's show, I'm actually going to be dissecting this report, dissecting Peel Holdings. We'll take a look at John Whitaker, the um, reclusive head of Peel Holdings. He owns uh, 75% of the company. He has a personal wealth estimated at some uh, uh, 2.1 billion pounds. He lives on the Isle of Man for fairly obvious tax reasons. And we'll be taking a look at Peel's fiefdom. And the reason that uh, we're going to take a look at Peel is because after Peel had served the eviction notice, a number of people who we spoke to in fact, a considerable number of people who we spoke to said, oh, you haven't got much chance if uh, you're up against Peel because Peel own everything around here and they probably own the judge. Well, on this occasion, it would seem they didn't. But nonetheless, we are going to be taking a look at what Peel believe they own and why it is that people in the northwest of England actually seem to be in fear of Peel. So Peel may have been a reclusive organisation that uh, they prefer that um, not too many people knew very much about. But we're about to try and change that. And we're about to look at uh, Peel's symbiotic relationship with iGas. It perhaps is no uh, accident that the iGas Petroleum Exploration and Development licences follow the Manchester Ship Canal right across to the uh, the Mersey and the Wirral. And uh, guess who owns the Manchester Ship Canal? Oh, it's Peel. So basically, anytime you look at anything in the Northwest, it pretty much comes back to Peel. Peel Holdings and John Whitaker. So if you want to see how a corporatist fiefdom operates, then tune in to next week's Fracking Nightmare, where Peel Holdings will literally be stripped bare. Talking of bear, um, this week Bear is back with us, and Bear is, uh, he's recovered from his, uh, his um, uh, illness, and he's back with us, and tonight he's going to be uh, looking with us at the current state of the UK groundwater and UK aquifers. But before I uh, bring Bear into the discussion, um, a couple of things that have gone uh, interestingly viral during the course of the week, not least this. This is Ray Tillerson, the Exxon Chief Executive Officer, who of course is uh, really pushing uh, the shale gas and coal bed methane agenda in the United States. In fact, if it wasn't for Exxon's involvement in the unconventional gas industry, then Exxon might be in danger of actually losing its number one spot as a global uh, oil company. But it seems that uh, things were getting a little bit too close to home. So he's now filing a lawsuit and uh, trying to um, ensure that uh, um, other companies are not permitted from fracking anywhere near his ranch. So now if the Exxon chief executive officer who tells everybody else that it's a safe process, but he doesn't want it in his backyard, doesn't that speak volumes? It's a bit like Dallas and Fort Worth actually banning fracking from the city limits. All the evidence is out there. All people have to do is take a look at it. Now, what else is in the news this week is this um, explosion in Pennsylvania in the uh, remote uh, Alapation community known as uh, Bobtown. Uh, needless to say, um, this had uh, quite a marked impact on the community. In fact, I believe that uh, tragically uh, some people are still missing. Um, presumed caught up in the... Uh, in the fire there. Um, but obviously it's also uh, causing, at, at the very least, smoke, but uh, more likely toxic fumes to be spreading across the community. But have no fear, because Chevron has acknowledged its social responsibility and has immediately sought to recompense the local community by offering a pizza voucher. And the letter says, We are sorry to have missed you. We wanted to provide you with a status update on the February 11th incident that occurred on the uh, Chev uh, Chevron's Alopecia um, 
Blanco H Wellpad in uh, Dunker Township and see if you had any questions or concerns that we could address. Chevron recognises the effect this has had on the community. We value being a responsible member of the community and will continue to strive to achieve incident-free operations. We are committed to taking action to safeguard our neighbours, our employees, our contractors and our environment. Yeah, just like Lord John Brown, really. You know, profit above all else. All else is just collateral. Well, nonetheless, as I said, Chevron... Uh, this is from the Chevron Community Outreach Team. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what they've offered. A gift certificate, a special combo only, a large pizza and one 24-ounce uh, drink. That's, um, that's a pint and a half in American. And uh, this is to the resident from Chevron Appalachia and Redeemable at Bobtown Pizza. Well, it's heartening to know that Chevron has uh, such a high regard for the local community that it could dig deep into the corporate finances and come up with a pizza voucher. So the people of Zurovlov in eastern Poland, who of course are uh, trying to prevent Chevron from getting their bits in the ground, have no fear. Because if the whole operation goes wrong, then you're going to get a pizza voucher. Aren't you the lucky ones? Well, Bear, are you there with us tonight? Hello, Bear. Bear? Hello, can you hear me? Bear, so uh, you what, would you, what would you do with your pizza voucher? <laughs> I'll probably order the most horrendous pizza I could find in San Oh, no, back. sorry, mate. You're limited to a special combo only. At the end, Do you know, what he actually, Ian, it actually reminds me, um, in uh, Germany during World War II, after the carpet bombing by the Allies of Western Germany, places like Dresden, the um, Hitlers uh, and the Nazi regime thought that the best thing to do for those people was to give them a free bottle of eggnog. Wow, it's really <laughs> impressive. I am so heartened that uh, Chevron um, lived up to its social responsibility. But now, listen, under US law, there is a sinister edge to this because those people that actually take that gift certificate and redeem it have effectively accepted that as total recompense. Um, under Pennsylvanian law, basically, if somebody offers a token um, as a recompense in the event of any incident and you accept it, then that is them free and clear. Um, you have no further claim upon them. So th this is ultimately, of course, I mean, uh, of course, I'm being totally facetious here in case anybody hadn't guessed. Um, but th I mean, this is completely outrageous. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it just shows the, the level of sociopathic uh, corporatism that we're dealing with, huh? Oh, totally. I mean, I'd be, I'd be very interested to find out as well how many of the people in Pennsylvania are actually aware of them taking this, offering this token recompense. And I'd, I'd love to know how many of them are actually aware that this is a legally binding contract, essentially. I'm pretty sure if you did the poll, you'd probably find out a very small percentage of the population realise that. Oh, exactly. And, and you know what's going to happen is that even the parents uh, who go, what? You know, a pizza voucher, and then they leave it on the kitchen counter, and then, you know, the kids come along and go, oh my gosh, look at this, a pizza voucher. And uh, so the kids go along, they redeem the pizza voucher, and that's it, Chevron are free and clear. I mean, this, <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to put it. It is disgusting. Uh, totally predictable, totally predictable, and Chevron's lawyers are obviously, you know, rubbing their hands in glee, thinking that, uh, you know, they've, they've come up with a scheme here that's going to save them literally billions. Well, I hope that the uh, local community, are, and I'm sure they are, are getting up to speed, they're collecting all these vouchers, and that mm. they will take them back to Chevron and tell them to stick them where the sun don't shine and on that note we'll take a short break sixty percent of the english countryside is under threat from fracking a process which has transformed the landscape in many parts of the united states and australia 
and contaminated the drinking water and air with highly toxic chemicals and gases. One in three hydraulic fracturing was using a carcinogen. So it really is a chemical cocktail that goes into the earth, of which up to 40% remains there. The grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and everything that was in the water was burnt. The MDs have been instructed not to report any negative health effects that they believe to be associated with living over a gas field. There's nothing inherent about the shale gas process that is going to lead to problems. Some of this material was actually taken to a large sewage treatment works, which had no capacity to handle radioactive materials of this kind. 800,000 gallons was dumped into the Manchester Ship Canal. 50 seismic events were recorded during just six fracking treatments. What is the minimum depth that the fracking will fracture? We can't tell you until we drill the excavation. Have you no idea whatsoever? Because it doesn't look like you've done your research. Shell gas is part of the future and we will make it happen. We are just numbers and we are sat on this rich vein of gas and they will do and say anything to get that gas out of the ground. And welcome back to Fracking Nightmare. This is part two of episode 17. Now Bear's going to be joining us a little bit later on in the show and uh, as I mentioned we're going to be looking at the current state of the British water supply and the levels of contamination and what has led to the current levels of contamination before the unconventional gas industry actually gets a foothold. But um, in this part of the show, I'm very pleased to welcome back my very good friend, Brian Monk from Southern Queensland in uh, Australia. So Brian, are you there, my friend? I am here. G golly, man, that beard is getting longer every time I, uh, I see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty proud of it now. I'm, 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 I, I've I'm, lost your sound there, but I lost you. You tugged your beard and I lost the sound. Oh, OK. Yeah, no, <laughs> it, it's grown. I'm becoming a bush ranger now. <laughs> Now, Brian, I know that um, you've um, uh, uh, had quite uh, some experiences since you were last with us at the beginning of November. So um, I know that the, the gas industry has literally started to encroach on the borders of your property. Absolutely. We're very lucky with a large property. It's five But they are drilling wells to our boundary as they are at the moment which is a little amusing because we actually have to go to see it. But if you were on a small property, say 50 or 100 acres, they would be in our face right now. So how far away from, um, from, your, from the, uh, the house are the, uh, are the rigs? The nearest rig is, is a, uh, uh, that's been here is about one point or something like that. Okay, Brian, the sound is actually breaking up a bit. Um, you know what, my friend, I think we may have to suggest that we turn off the video because I think the video may be taking quite a bit of the bandwidth. Okay, not a problem. I'll turn that off. Okay, that already sounds clearer. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, that's a lot better. So, sorry, can you say again, how, how close is the, uh, is the closest rig to the house? Probably 1.2, 1.3 kilometres, something like that, nearly a mile. And are they drilling under your property? No, they're not doing horizontal drilling. Uh, they're just doing vertical drilling in this area. OK, but this is, it's, a, it's a production well into the, coal, uh, into the coal seams, yeah? Or is it an exploratory well? No, no, we're, we're in uh, a Jamet gas field uh, from British Gas or BG Group. <clears throat> and uh, no, it's a it's a full production well, uh, not in production yet because the gathering lines aren't built. But they're rapidly building gathering lines now. 
Okay, so the, uh, the, the well is into the coal seams. Obviously, they're looking for what you guys call coal seam gas, what we call coal bed methane. And um, now they had to uh, obviously get rid of the water in the seams because that's the process that actually enables the gas to flow. Uh, did they actually have to frack the seams to, uh, to enable the dewaterification de process? I've lost you, Brian. Brian, I think I've lost the link. If I was a conspiracy theorist, my gosh. Brian? No, I think, unfortunately, we have um, we've lost the link with uh, with Brian. We'll, we'll try and uh, we'll try and get that back in a, a little later on the show. I think what we'll do is maybe we could uh, bring Bear back in. Um, we'll, we'll see if we can get the problem resolved in the next break. So Bear. Bear is coming back on stream in just a second. Meanwhile, while we're waiting, while we're waiting for Bear, let's just um, take another look at uh, something that occurred at, uh, at Barton Moss um, on uh, Friday of last week. There was a particularly aggressive uh, police operation on Friday and this was probably in response to the fact that Peel hadn't got their way and so Peel's QC and Amanda Webster and everyone else that's uh, got a finger in this disgusting pie probably had a word in the police's ear and said, OK, let's give the Barton Moss protection camp a, a really hard time. And uh, so they forced the, the line down the road. And for the uh, actually, I think this is the first time that I've seen it. There was actually a sergeant calling the shots on the line. You can see the inspector with the red lapel uh, behind the sergeant here. But the guy who was actually calling the shots was this guy, Sergeant um, 6884. Uh, of course, um, the standard practice now in Greater Manchester Police is to refuse to give you their name and simply uh, give you their number. Well, Sergeant 6884 was, I uh, regret to say, a classic example of psychological reframing and probably um, topped up with steroids as well. It was very clear from his behavior, you can see this for yourself on the video footage, on the live streams from Bambooza. And this guy was um, in very aggressive mode. I mean, even ripping into one of his own officers for uh, breaking the line at one point. On the uh, right hand side of the screen, you can see a young girl looking back there. She's 15 year old Saffron Callahan. And uh, Saffron was at Barton Moss as part of a school project. She was with her stepmother and her uncle. And uh, she was in the front line. And you remember, this is a peaceful protest. There has not been a single element of aggression from any one of the protection community in the entire Barton Moss campaign, as the video evidence will, of course, support. So any suggestion by the police that there has been anything other than peaceful protest is actually a fundamental lie. And we know they cannot produce a single piece of video footage to support such a claim. Well, young Saffron was eventually arrested for aggravated trespass. And as the video footage would show, she is doing nothing more than walking down in front of the police line. She was being brutally pushed down the lane and the police officer behind her was effectively grinding himself into her as they were walking down the lane. Saffron was eventually arrested and uh, despite the fact that the police's own guidelines are that in the case of a minor being arrested, if at all possible, an adult should be um, able to accompany them to the police station. But Saffron, despite the fact she was with her stepmother, was not afforded that courtesy. And she was taken to Swinton Police Station 
where she was held for some five hours before being released to a rapturous welcome uh, by the uh, protection community that had gathered outside Swinton Police Station. So although, of course, there is a mainstream or lamestream, as I prefer to call it, media blackout on all things Barton Moss, the alternative community will continue to put out the information, to put out the video footage and to expose the lies and the deceit being put out by the Greater Manchester Police and um, all those who are part of uh, this abomination. Well, meanwhile, Bear is back with us. Bear, are you with us? Hi. Yeah, I'm back in. Okay, thanks for, for standing in there. Well, unfortunately, we lost uh, Brian. We'll try and get Brian back um, when we take a, a break in about uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, but Bear, now this week, uh, by the way, welcome back. And uh, you're definitely yeah. uh, looking um, uh, as though you're back on form. Oh, I am. I'm happily recovered. It was one of the worst bouts of flu I think I've ever had. Oh, well, keep it to yourself, my friend. That's the last thing, <laughs> last thing I need. Oh, well, don't worry. Uh, so, Bear, now this week you're going to uh, talk to us about the current state of the British um, groundwater and the aquifer system, I believe. <clears throat> yeah, that's correct. It's sort of um, a precursor to me studying the um, known contamination or studies that have found problems with contamination from fracking into groundwater. I thought it would be a good idea to actually look into the information that's available about the current state of British groundwater, um, the aquifer systems, how much water we extract, and also what, which ones of these have already been compromised from our industrial activities, both presently and in the past as well. Um, the th three sources that I've used for most of my information is a re uh, two reports. Now, I think these were done in 2007, but it does show the UK government's ability to write a basic technical report because there was no dates in yep. either of the reports <laughs> that I studied. That's convenient. Both done by the, yeah, well, yeah, I know. Both by the Environment Agency, um, the two main ones. One is Underground Under Threat an environment agency report into ground war from 2007 and directly linked to that is um, the environment agency ground war protection policy and practice gp3 and a third one that i've uh, it's just come out um, last month is a the shale gas and water independent review by the uh, chartered institute of water and environmental management so these are the three main documents i've taken um, almost all the information i'm going to be recounting today OK, now th this is, of course, the current state of play um, as per these reports. So this is before any uh, hydraulic fracturing actually takes place in the UK. Yeah, that, that's correct. And it was actually quite um, disturbing to find out how much of our water is already under threat from various agricultural industrial processes. Um, I'll, I'll run through with some figures about, about um, how much groundwater usage we generally use today in the UK. Um, on average, 2004 and 2005, about 150 litres of water were supplied to each person in England and Wales. So that's 150 litres per person. And that totally approximates to about 9 million cubic metres a day. That, and that's a vast amount of water. But in general, compared to how much water we do have, it isn't actually that much. Um, the, I mean, the main aquifers in, the, um, in England are the chalk, which most people will have heard of in the south and the east of England, sandstone in the west, and the central Midland area, limestone. But usable ground war is predicted to lie underneath about 85% of the UK land surface. So you, you, we have a massive resource here. It is, a, you know, it's, this is one of the best things about Britain with regards to the resources that are essential to life, is that we do have a lot of free, clean drinking water available, essentially. Now, for those that don't know, uh, groundwater forms from rainwater that falls on land naturally migrates through cracks and pores in the surface until it reaches an impermeable barrier. So that's a rock it can't move through, such as a highly dense shale. <laughs> that's a good example. Uh, now, groundwater can be various ages. Um, it's not as if all the water in an aquifer comes from one point in time. Some of the water at the surface of an aquifer, near, near, well, as in the, the, the point nearest to the surface of the ground, that can be up to several months old, whereas water at the base of aquifers can be up to millions of years old. But, and this is something I'll stress, we don't know. Um, one of the main reasons is that we just don't have the studies and surveys that have been done to understand the actual mechanisms that are at play in the deeper part of our aquifers and how that relates. Because there are certain points where we do know that water can go for kilometres underground from surface aquifers. There's some sort of migration, but what it is, we can't predict. 
why it's happening, we don't know, but the distance it goes down is into the area that fracking will potentially be taking place, you know, several thousand metres down in certain points. So the repeated times they've stated that the surface aquifers are, not go are nowhere near the subsurface geology that they're going to be fracking is actually a misnomer, it's a lie, because there are points where there is intermingling of these waters, and we don't know enough about the mechanisms to be able to say what potentially could happen from that. Well, Bear, I, when I, I spoke with a, a hydrologist who came to one of my Fractured Future events last year, and um, he was concerned because he told me that in his opinion, his um, um, academic opinion, that uh, basically all of the aquifers uh, beneath the UK were in some way interlinked. It is quite possible. I mean, it, one thing that I found from um, the studies, especially from the chart surveyed study on shale gas and water, was that they're only now, once again, only now, uh, BGS and other geological agencies and the, obviously the industry are collaborating to create a model and a map to understand the unique hydrological features in the UK because obviously the, as been mentioned before the UK has a very complicated geology which will obviously directly affect how fracking will take place in this country and also the water systems that are in, intermingled in these geological con you know like it, the, the way to describe a lot of people see, think of water running through caves and through um, almost like fairy tale grottos on the ground most of the time it's moving through tiny pore spaces in what would appear to us as solid rock so there's no way to actually be able to tell without knowing how every rock behaves over the entirety of the UK, how this water intermingles and where this water actually can move to. And as I say, so in some cases, it's millions of years. Um, just as an example, I found here, you know, I found is that um, the, the aquifers in the southeast of England, the water that's extracted periodically from the lower part of that, last fell on the surface of the earth as rain 20,000 years ago in the last ice age. So that can give you an idea that there's water moving around that hasn't seen the light of day for thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years in certain cases. So it's quite possible that, that aquifer systems are connected in ways that we can't even begin to imagine, simply because we, we've never been down that deep or we haven't dug or boreholes in that area to find out. And we have, of course, we have saline aquifers and we have uh, freshwater aquifers and um, uh, there seems to be some process by which these are, uh, are kept separate. Yeah, um, well, that's the thing. They're not entirely separate. This is something that my studies, you know, I, I, my specialisation in geology, I did my dissertation in hydrogeology, in groundwater systems, so it's something I have a passion for. And um, I studied a, a hydrological system um, in North Yorkshire called Harrogate. Um, well, it's a town called Harrogate, rather, but it's the Harrogate Spring Systems, and that's a unique feature in the world. There's nowhere else that that many chemical-rich um, springs occur at surface in such a small range with no, um, with no understanding of the mechanisms. And uh, literally, it's a case that there can be springs 10 metres away from each other, less distance, a couple of metres, that are completely different. And this is, these spring systems occur on a hill. Mm. Surrounded by valleys on either side, so it's a hydrostatic high point. It's a point where water shouldn't be coming out of, essentially. You know, it's where water should be coming from to issue its springs further down the, the geology and the geography. And, and so this is, a, this is an example of a unique feature in the world in the middle of a very populated area that's been studied by innumerable people, myself included, and they have no idea of how these highly saline waters, highly sulphur-rich waters, or not interestingly, the sulphur-rich waters in Harrogate are saturated with methane as well, interestingly, um, how these come to surface. So that, this is, once again, it points to that it's a case that it's not a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of any studies. Well, it's a lack of knowledge resulting from the fact that nobody's actually been able to study, study this in depth across the whole of the UK to build up these pictures. So the, the saline and the freshwater aquifers, as I've said, that there's points where there isn't mingling over kilometres of distance, and we just don't know what the mechanisms are that cause these. But with putting extra stresses down there, i.e., fractures and slick and um, slicking on fault systems so the potential for seismic events all you're going to do is disrupt these systems that we don't even know how they work anyway well and as you made the observation um i mean the the shale effectively is until it's fracked um an impermeable geological strata mm -hmm. and exactly. uh with um very very minimalistic um 
uh, porosity and permeability. I mean, uh, literally probably being, what, well, in the Pico-Darcy range. Um, I, mean, I mean, basically, near as damn it, impervious. And then man comes along and says, yeah, yeah, but um, that impervious uh, geology, it's got something we want, i.e. gas. And so we're just going to break it up. We're, we're going to create artificial permeability, artificial porosity, and uh, regardless of the, the implications, huh? Yeah, that's it. You know, it's the, the more that you look into fracking from every area, from the two studies that I've looked into, plus the groundwater, so the air emissions, there's just a lack of knowledge. And this isn't just a lack of knowledge in the fracking industry or the petroleum industry. It's just a lack of general knowledge anyway. So we, we've no idea what potentially... I mean, with fracking, the only way we can understand or identify the risks that we're, we are creating is by observation. The problem is, due to laws like in America, you're mentioning about the fact of the, the law is that if somebody accepts that pizza token, that they've, um, that they've waived their rights to complain about it in the future. Well, the things like the Halliburton law, um, the loophole that was put into place by Dick Cheney, who was the, the CEO of Halliburton, the company that was directly responsible for developing fracking, um, and as when he was the vice president of the United States under George W. Bush, interesting that he pushed through a lot of pro-oil um, lobby legislation. Um, but one of the things he put through was that we don't that no company in America actually has to um, identify a report if it basically if it pollutes an aquifer. So as a result, we don't have the knowledge coming through from existing areas where this industry is taking place. We don't know what's actually down there. So in all in all, it's just basically a great grey area. And we are essentially, it's like shooting blind, you know, or Russian roulette. It's, it's that sort of equivalent because we just don't know the potentials of what we're doing. And all, we see, is, all we see is the manifestation in terms of uh, people losing their livelihoods because the, the groundwater is contaminated. Um, so they lose the ability to grow crops, to maintain livestock and, of course, to use the water for any domestic purpose. And the gas company comes along and provides them with a buffalo tank. But, of course, at the same time says, yeah, but, you know, it was nothing to do with us. I mean, we're, we're not actually offering you fresh water because we're accepting any responsibility. We're just being neighbourly. We, we just heard that you had a problem with your water and, you know, we want to we wanna help out. And, of course, once again, once you accept the buffalo tank, um, which normally, of course, comes with the caveat that you actually have to sign a confidentiality agreement and an agreement to say that you will not seek any further claim against the gas company. So, you know, when you've got the likes of Lord John Brown and David Cameron and all the other mother frackers actually saying, well, you know, but there's never been any evidence and confirmed reports, scientifically confirmed reports of uh, fracking causing contamination of groundwater, they're hiding behind this fact that the gas industry in the US has the equivalent of diplomatic immunity. Yeah, yeah more or less. Essentially, they are a law unto themselves. Um, you know, it, it's one of the problems we face. It's something Tina Louise mentioned in last week's is that we are finding one of the biggest series of companies in the world, the, the oil multinationals, and they have the money to be able to throw away, literally, to get their way in governments and to lobby um, you know, either local government or national government to be able to promote their agenda in this, in this, sort, of, this sort of area. Well, and, um, and that, you know, on that note there, um, I mean, it's a, it's a very pertinent point for me to introduce that uh, this fact that we are up against literally the deepest pockets on the planet not oh, just yes. it, not just in terms of an industry but also in terms of a political uh, commitment to an industry that uh, anyone with an ounce of um, curiosity would within a half an hour to an hour know that this is something that we shouldn't um, have in our backyard or our country, period. But we are up against it. And, uh, uh, you know, some people seem to think that, um, you know, we should do this on a part-time basis and, uh, um, you know, we should oppose this in our spare time. Yet we're up against professionals. I mean, we've got uh, Hill and Knowlton effectively looking after the PR campaign in the US, which of course is the same company, PR company that was employed by the tobacco industry to uh, convince people that there was absolutely no link whatsoever between smoking and, uh, and lung cancer. And, you know, in this country, of course, we've got the likes of Bell Pottinger and these PR companies. I mean, let's understand that they are paid enormous amounts of money 
to basically lie. Except that they would argue that they're not really lying because they don't really know the full facts. So they're only spinning what they've been told. And it's like the um, chief operating officer, Dave Kerr of... Uh, of Sorry, he's not. It's uh, Blamires, John Blamires. So forgive me, John Blamires didn't say this. It was Dave Kerr who said it, who I think is the projects manager with iGas, who said that it's not their responsibility to actually look at the damage that this industry has caused elsewhere. So, you know, we really are up against it. And um, um, I you know, have to acknowledge that uh, the work that I do and many others is absolutely dependent on... Uh, people's generosity uh, because you know I don't have a salary I don't have an income yes it's a choice yes it's an absolute choice and uh, you know somebody actually asked me today you know Ian what would you do if somebody came along and offered you uh, a sum of money just to shut up and go away and I said you know um, it wouldn't even be a tough call I would immediately obviously tell them where to take a hike but uh, nonetheless, I mean, I effectively choose the lifestyle, as do you, Bear, and as mm -hmm. do uh, you know, many of the other people who are dedicated to ensuring this industry doesn't get off the ground. And, um, you know, so I appeal to people uh, to help us. And uh, this is the website to go to. It's frackingnightmare.com. Uh, and um, here we get it up on screen here. <laughs> in, a, in a second I, w I will in a second uh, frackingnightmare.com and uh, on the left hand side of the page there uh, you will see there's an opportunity to uh, make a donation apparently it's not going to come up on screen uh, but frackingnightmare.com and anything that you can anything that you feel you can contribute whether it's a, a one off donation or a, a monthly donation every little helps we are up against the deepest pockets we're, we're up against um, organizations that can afford what they believe to be the best and the brightest and, and i would have to say you know it's thanks to the likes of uh, lee day and um, lindsay johnson uh, uh, the barrister who offered their services uh, pro bono uh, last week to help us fight off Peel's attempts to evict. But it's not always going to be that way. And if we lose that case, then certainly Peel do have uh, the right to seek costs. But it's not just those, the legal costs, it's the day-to-day -day expenses um, of just getting from A to B and uh, yeah, running around. T totally correct, Ian. I mean, it's one of the things from, I mean, from my times in Occupy, I was bowled over by the social cooperation that became, came to the fore during those times. And this is a similar thing with the camps, is the one thing that's been able to sustain people is the communities getting involved. It's local people willing to donate energy, time and resources to the camp. And for people like ourselves, we, we are doing this off our own backs. You know, I mean, it's something that it's a hard life. And we, are, we do live off generosity. And I must thank anybody, anybody and everybody out there who has already helped myself and those involved like yourself in this. You know, thank you for what you have already done. And please keep helping if you can, because this is something we need to fight on every front. Absolutely. I mean, otherwise, the, the reality is that um, you know, we will be condemning future generations to lives of absolute abject misery. And not to mention, of course, the fact that, uh, you know, there's a direct impact on people's own investments because values of properties will fall. And as we showed in last week's uh, edition, already insurance companies are stating when asked the question that the house insurance will not cover any damage that is associated with hydraulic fracturing. And uh, as I'm sure many people are aware, if you know that, you will have to declare it if you try to sell your house. <laughs> Um, because if you know it and don't declare it, then you can be held responsible at a later date. And the moment that you announce that uh, your house is, um, is confirmed as being uninsurable with regards to hydraulic fracturing, you're going to find it extremely difficult to sell it, even if you drop, you know, drop the price. Well, so, yeah, it's in God. I was going to say, and it's interesting you say that because a lot of the studies that I've done actually echo that, but from earlier um, um, activity. So from mining, the same thing 
is is prevalent in certain areas it's incredibly hard to get housing insurance in places like the northeast of england because there is the mining there was so extensive the potential damage that it could do you know like from leaked groundwater pollution um, and mining collapse that you know th this has already affected people before in the past but it's something that's conveniently forgotten which is something that my research has pulled out i mean if i'll throw a few figures in i mean um in 1994 it was estimated that abandoned coal mines have polluted more than 400 kilometers of rivers um, with pollutants such as iron, zinc, lead, cadmium and acidic groundwaters. Um, I mean, in places like Cornwall, there's one mine where they have to treat 17,000 cubic metres a day, otherwise it would pollute the entire local ecosystem with heavy metals. And in Sunderland, they have to pump out 5,000 cubic metres of water a day just to stop polluting the um, public groundwater in that area. Uh, and this is when they catch it. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, this is when they catch it. I mean, once again, one of the problems with hydrogeology and geology of any form is that they can, you can happily try and predict what's going to happen, but you just don't know. So that the, a lot of these mine systems, they've been abandoned, you know, like, sealed off, and they've been they've pumped for a while, but the pumps have been switched off, and the groundwater is slowly rising back up, and it can turn up in the most obscure of places. I know of a church in, I, th I swear, is it Hortonley Hole, I believe it is, near Sunderland. I studied, and it's in the bottom of a hydrostatic low. It's in the bottom of a, a small valley. And for some reason, the church started to flood after the local mine closed down, <laughs> but only the church. All the properties around it, or the cellars that are exactly the same level, none of them have been touched. So this just shows the unique features that can suddenly occur from subsurface geology. You know, that this, from what I know now, that church has been bulldozed and the area turned into a park because they've tried um, pumping it 24 hours a day. And there was nothing they could do. Every time they emptied it, it just flooded straight back up within a couple of hours. So that, that should give an, you know, an idea that, that even with the mining industry, which was so, went on so heavily for so long, with so much knowledge of what it was doing subsurface, even they still can't understand or predict what's going to happen once they finish their industry. So, uh, Bear, the response from the British government and the industry is, but we have the most robust regulatory controls in place and this will not happen. This this is the UK. You know, what happens elsewhere in the world? Well, you know, that's elsewhere. This is the UK. So what would your response be to that, polite, the polite response that is? Well, my polite response would be, if this is the UK and this is the, one of the strictest regulatory regimes out there, how is it that 60% of all aquifers and groundwater in the UK, that's 60%, are at risk from nitrates from past and present agricultural um, activities? And that's an increase from 1992 of 1,000 million litres of polluted uh, water per day to 3,500 million litres per day since 1995. How can 24% of groundwater's uh, bodies be at risk from diffuse pollution from urban environments and up to 12 percent of um, water bodies um, groundwater bodies are at risk from the co former mining industry so if we have such a strict regulatory regime how is it the fact that we've got where literally over half of the water systems we rely on and i mean in places like the southeast of england they extract 74% of all their water from the, uh, the groundwater aquifer, so that's south of London. And realistically, on the figures that I've found, that certain places in the southeast of England, they have less water available per person per day than they do in Syria. You know, and that's in the southeast of England. How can you realistically claim to have the regulatory systems that are going to manage this when already there's a dis direct environmental impact on our aquifers and you're about to severely cut and reduce the, in the authority, the environment agency that is mandated to actually you know, like maintain the, the, these sort of environmental factors. Well, and of course, um, you know, if we look at what's going on elsewhere in the world as well, like in California right now, where mm. California is in extreme drought, and uh, yet, the, like in West Texas, the gas companies are getting precedence over the, um, the citizen and the water companies are literally um, selling the, the water to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder is basically the gas company. So, you know, th this is corporatism. It, it's effectively genocidal corporatism because the corporations, of course, don't give a second thought to the fact that there are entire communities, an increasing number of communities, that do not have access to sufficient fresh water for you know, sustaining themselves, let alone uh, their livelihoods. 
I totally agree. And um, whilst I'll, I'll like to finish with what I've been saying now, um, with a quote, if you want to, I think you've got that. If you could put that up on screen, oh, I don't have it there. Sorry. Oh, don't, oh okay. Well, okay, I'll read it out then. Please. Um, Talk with what you've just said there about the, the companies in California, the water companies are selling it to the gas companies. Now in the UK, we have quite a long, and I'm very proud of the socialised history of our, you know, like our water and NHS and our, you know the the fire services and utilities. Even though they have strayed quite a lot from the path, that I think they were originally set up for these days. But I found this. Now this quote is not from any form of corporate document. This is actually from what I mentioned before: underground, under threat, the Environment Agency report on groundwater. Now to what you've just said this fits in perfectly I feel and I found this quote very disturbing um, with regards to the groundwater situation in the UK we are carrying out research to try to place an economic value on groundwater now this I'll say as an aside here I see it as no in no way an economic resource this is a human right an inalienable right as access to fresh water now, as water resources become scarcer, either from climate change or increased use by society, then the value of groundwater could and probably will increase. This could encourage trading in groundwater, and people could manage groundwater better, knowing that the costs involved to save water or improve quality could be off bar offset by selling it at a higher price. Groundwater will become another asset to be traded, bringing a great awareness of its value. And I stress, this is from our own environment agency, uh, supposedly an independent, non-corporate agency, a public body there for the public benefit, that to me is sounding very much like a corporate body. Well, they're, they're not there for, as we know, they're not there for the benefit of the public. Uh, the environment agency is simply there to interface between the corporations and the public and to create the impression that they are there to operate in the public interest when in yeah, fact totally. they are not. Yeah. They are specifically tasked with ensuring that the, uh, the path is cleared for the corporations to basically do whatever it is they want to do. Uh, essentially, that's sorry, I just it. lost you there for a second, Bear. <laughs> it's all right. I noticed. Thanks. Um, it's one of the it's one of the problems we face that few you know that, that I've I've met, meet a lot of resistance from people who believe that the government is there as almost like a watch guard on corporations without and making people try to realise that essentially I mean with what I mean Lord Brown is a perfect example of this from Quadrilla. Um, I think was it eighty eight. NEDs he had placed into various government departments yes. or non-elected directors whose job is to make government agencies and government departments run more efficiently as business. So in essence, you can, you know, as soon as you start to find out things like this, obviously these things have been occurring for a while, but this is almost like a shameless, we're not hiding anymore, we're just being, we're just turning government into another corporation. Well, they, they actually believe that the British population are uh, so dumbed down that um, even if it becomes obvious to everybody, the British po population can be kept on the sofa with the likes of Coronation Street, East Enders, Strictly, <laughs> and all that good stuff. Well, you know, uh, uh, let me uh, say that my prognosis as an analyst is that, um, you know, we might be uh, not quite in the Kiev situation just yet, but we are heading down that path. We have a, a, a government that uh, is clearly corporatist, which is another word for fascist, clearly corporatist and does not have the best interests of the population of this country at heart. And as an increasing percentage of the population realise that, then the political scenario may change quite dramatically. Bear, we've uh, run out of time, but thank you so much again for your uh, contribution. And um, hopefully you'll stay well and be with us next week. Oh, well, indeed, Ian. Thank you for having me on the show again. Thanks a lot, my friend. Now, uh, before we um, uh, hang up for the day, I'm just going to get a, an indication as to whether we can run an extra few minutes here. You know, that's OK. That's good. Um, uh, we will try and go back to, uh, to Brian Monk shortly. But before we go to Brian, um, I want to uh, bring in Adam Willis, who uh, represents uh, Frack Free Knots, Frack Free Nottinghamshire. So if, if we could get Adam on the line, uh, because um, Danes Hill in Nottinghamshire is uh, now under attack by Dart Energy who are looking to establish a, uh, a pad there and there were a number of people at um, 
uh, Danes Hill at the weekend, uh, letting it be known that uh, they were not going to allow DART to come onto the pad and start their exploratory drilling unimpeded. So, Adam, uh, can you hear me? I can indeed, Ian. Hi. Adam, I can see you now. Thanks very much for, uh, for joining us and uh, welcome to Fracking Nightmare. Um, I don't know, did you uh, listen to any of the conversation I've just had with Bear? I just missed a tiny bit. I've just finished work, I'm afraid. OK, well, thanks for taking the time to, uh, to come join us anyway. We were just talking about the current state of the, uh, the UK water supply and the fact that even before the mother frackers get their bits in the ground, we're already dealing with um, an increasingly contaminated uh, resource. But now over in Nottinghamshire, of course, this uh, once upon a time was the um, uh, home of the, the mining industry. And, and in fact, that, of course, is what the unconventional gas industry wants to exploit. It wants to get down into the uh, no longer used coal seams of the East Midlands and exploit the coal bed methane. But uh, you guys have other ideas. So tell me what's going on with uh, the anti-fracking community in Nottinghamshire. Uh, well, we met at the first site, um, Sutton Cum Lound, uh, on Saturday. Um, it was a good mix of people. There was Frack Free South Yorkshire and Batters Law, as well as local residents, and uh, obviously Frack Free Nottinghamshire were there. Um, we had a look down at the site, which um, it did used to be a nice green area. Um, unfortunately, that's been flattened now, ready for, uh, ready for bringing in the equipment. But uh, there seems to be a good consensus that we can get this stopped. So what kind of security? We've got a picture on screen here of a group of people, a group of people around the, the gate. I'm assuming that's the, uh, the site entrance. Um, and there's a couple of, uh, looks like police officers in their, their high-vis uh, jackets there. Oh yeah, there we have the, uh, the police vehicle. So obviously the, the police came down to uh, see what was going on. So, well, they, I was going to say they seem to be like a, yeah, like a security team, um, very cagey about telling us um, even where they were from, if they were locals or if they knew anything about fracking. Um, within you know minutes of us showing up, they were they were on the phones and stuff, um, probably just being told not to say anything. And uh, but. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we try to explain to them if they research fracking, do they know what it involves, do they know why they're here in the first place. So, uh, you know, maybe something sunk in, I hope so. So is it, it, the picture that I'm looking at right now, if we can bring this picture back onto the screen, is this the, uh, the pad? Is this where the pad is going to be uh, located? That is the first one, yes. Um, now, looking at the, the plans they've put ahead, it's, there's, uh, there is a site, but there's also site one. So... You know, it looks like they're, you know, it's not just going to be the one pad. They're looking at trying to expand, um, you know, look at, looking for this uh, coal bed methane. So, you know, the sooner we can get this stopped, the better. Of course, that's, that's one thing that people don't realise is that this isn't just one pad uh, because we are talking uh, unconventional geology and the, the reach of the wells is, is very limited. We are looking at six to eight pads per square mile, potentially. And uh, so, you know, we are literally looking at the, well, 64% of the country becoming um, excessively industrialised. I mean, not necessarily in my lifetime, but quite possibly in, in yours. And obviously, uh, it's a lot easier to stop something from starting than it is to try and stop it once it has started. Well, indeed. And when you're looking at the, um, the uh, just surrounding areas, you've got, uh, I mean, there's a nature reserve, there's a wildfowl reserve there. Um, it's, you know, Sutton Cum Lound and um, in the surrounding area, it is a, on a floodplain for the River Idle anyway. So any water contamination is, you know, potentially absolutely disastrous. I mean, any water contamination is bad, but I mean, this looks to be, you know, a, a big, big scale thing that could be a massive effects for not just the locals, for for the wider community. So worst case scenario, we could be looking at what occurred in Colorado last year, where um, uh, goodness knows what volume of chemicals were uh, washed off the various frack pads in the, in the floods there. And uh, you know, in reality, I mean, it'll never be known because the, the oil and gas industry in the US is not required to uh, reveal that information. But um, obviously the population density in, 
everywhere in this country is a lot greater than it is uh, in Colorado. Um, how how, uh, how widely do you think the word is getting out around the, uh, the Nottinghamshire area and South Yorkshire area that this is a threat and that basically it has to be stopped before it even gets started? Well, it's, it's always encouraging to see that the, the numbers of the group seem to be growing and growing and the network seem to be working as far as linking different um, different groups together and having a good amount of communication to get things done um, as regards to raising awareness um, and, you know, setting up meetings, things like that. Um, it seems to me that you've either got a mixture of people of either they they don't really have an opinion or they are against it. And I mean, the people that don't have an opinion have just really not done any research into it. So, um, you know, we take it as a responsibility to society as a whole, really, to just to, to explain what it is, you know, to let people do their own research, not just take our word for it. And, um, and come up with their conclusions. I mean, you know, I've seen that everyone seems to be coming from the same conclusion as this is totally hostile to um, not just our way of life, but all, you know, na nature, nature as a whole. Yeah, all life. Absolutely. All life. <laughs> well, hey, listen, uh, Adam, um, unfortunately, you know, we're a bit short on uh, time tonight, but um, hopefully you'll come back and uh, keep us posted. And hopefully by the next time that we speak, there will actually be a camp established and that uh, Dart Energy <laughs> will uh, start to learn that, um, you know, they're not going to have a free ride of bringing uh, vehicles onto the pad even though the uh, you know they're still at the hardcore stage by the looks of things and mm. uh, and, and building the pad um, you know the uh, anti fracking community needs to get in there at the earliest juncture and uh, use the opportunity to let the investment community know that uh, basically they're throwing their money into a black hole because this is an industry that isn't going to get established in the UK because it doesn't have the social license and it never will have. And of course this will be seen in the coming elections when already we're seeing uh, candidates from all parties uh, saying, oh no, 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 we're against fracking, we're against fracking. But uh, you well, know what, it doesn't matter what crossed. they say. Because the, as long as if their political party still supports uh, fracking, then as we're seeing in many locations, and particularly in Barton Moss, where Barbara Keeley, the uh, MP, has been consistent in her opposition to fracking, but no one really gives a damn what she thinks, not least of all, I guess. Indeed, yes. I mean, we do have uh, public meetings set up, and uh, obviously, I mean, things like checking the Facebook pages. There is a, uh, a public meeting in Retford on March 19th. Um, so, I mean, that's really for outreach and letting as many people as possible know what's a, what's pro, what they're going to try and do. So, which is, uh, a, which is the Facebook page that people should go to, Adam? Uh, I mean, Frack Free Nottinghamshire is a, is a good one. There's also Frack Free South Yorkshire and Frack Free Battislaw as far as locality. But, you know... Good, you know, if you go on Facebook and you type in, fr you know, anti-fracking or frack free, I mean, you'll you'll find your local uh, your local group there. If there's not one, maybe you should start one. So. Uh uh, you know. Exactly. If there isn't one, you should start one because that's the way this uh, campaign will be won. Small, totally autonomous, self-empowered groups all operating, networking, but operating autonomously, letting any creativity and any initiative bear fruit. Adam, thanks very much for joining us. And, um, uh, well, good luck with the campaign. I'm sure I shall be in uh, the Nottinghamshire area in the not-too-distant future. Uh, meanwhile, this okay. week, I am in um, Chawton, Chawton cum Hardy, in, on the south side of uh, Manchester, uh, where I'll be speaking at the Chawton Irish Club in High Lane. If we can bring that onto the screen, I think we can see that. The title of the talk is To Be or Not To Be Totally Fracked. And uh, hopefully uh, we will have a number of people who are pro-fracking or, of course, undecided coming along to the meeting uh, because that's the purpose. Um, you know, not a lot necessary to be gained from preaching to the choir, but the choir is expanding at a phenomenal rate of knots. Now, unfortunately, I think we have run out of time. Let's just see if Brian Monk is, can we see if Brian Monk is still online? He is online. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to get him. Oh, we're trying to get him. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll call it a night and we'll see if we can get um, Brian. Oh, we have got Brian. So we'll just say hi to Brian. Brian. Yes, how are you? Oh, that sounds a lot better. I mean, we're, we're way past the normal end of the show, but um, if we've got a good connection, maybe we can talk for a few minutes and perhaps I can get you to come back next week. Brian? Ah, no, looks like we've lost the line again. Well, we'll see what we can do about that. I know, you know, Brian uh, has had some difficulty with his internet. Uh, I know he had to go out and get a new modem over the weekend to even be able to hook up with us tonight. So uh, uh, thanks for making that effort, Brian. It, it's very much appreciated. And, uh, you know, we do want to talk to you because you of all people have uh, now nearly six years experience of the coal seam gas, coal bed methane industry. You are living in a contaminated environment and um, you know, your experience is absolutely crucial to helping people in the UK comprehend and understand the magnitude of the risk associated with this industry. Those who insist on saying it is safe, those who insist on say, stating that we have the most robust regulatory controls. The reality is, every time you hear the word robust, you know immediately that the person using the word knows nothing and certainly is not speaking from any um, real wisdom. So, as is always the case, don't take our word for it. Research it for yourself. Fracking nightmare. Not to be unleashed in my backyard or in my country. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week, hopefully with Brian Monk.